uh, had some questions, and I'll ask you to jump in, Richard. One question we had was, what criteria should we use to determine how much functionality to roll out in these kind of uh, projects, and how quickly, especially in the, in the face of emerging and, and changing standards? Is there some way to kind of determine which features and when you should be rolling out? Uh, yes, I think the usual planning standards that are used really come into play here. And one of the things that I think is one of the topics of this discussion is the importance of doing both a, a small-scale test where the focus is on functionality of the individual components and the ability of the individual components to interoperate successfully with each other. And then the second stage, which is which is equally critical, is to scale up still in a test environment, though, and determine where there are potential scaling issues in the overall solution. Because uh, as David was pointing out, the volume of data is so high compared to what has been uh, used in, in the older style that it's, it's quite likely that there will be multiple areas of the total solution where there are problems with scale that will need to be addressed. And, you know, as usual, that uh, there are different ways that you can deal with that once you hit those. But identifying those in a test phase is uh, certainly critical to a successful rollout. Richard, here's, a, I think, what's an important definitional question, uh, you know, and um, our, our listener says that understanding that there's no universally agreed definition of an MDM, meter data management system, what are you, uh, what are the presenters, you, Richard, in this case, consider as the key functions or components that should comprise an MDM? Uh, well, essentially, the, the MDM is the key front-end system that needs to be capable of uh, retaining the data and sorting it and uh, also uh, providing a first-level analytics and uh, analytic functions. It also needs to be an application that can interoperate well with the downstream users of the data. And that's very important because in almost every client that we've worked with, there are many different using applications who will need to access the data. Billing applications are obviously that's the most uh, important and, and basic. But to really get the full value out of smart meters and the smart grid, as, as David has just shown, there's, there's a whole slew of benefits that utilities are looking for, everything from uh, reducing theft to self-healing grids, and those imply that there will have to be a number of separate applications, uh, some of them analytics, some of them perhaps more operational, attaching all of them going at the meter data management system or uh, downloading snapshots of data as they need it. Outage data, uh, outage and restoration uh, go through the MDMS? Uh, y yes, I think in most cases there's a connection between those two. Uh, you know, sometimes outages are very small, and so actually having the smart meters have the ability to report extremely localized outages to a system that is more focused on uh, outages is one big advantage that the smart meters give. It actually can remove the necessity for customers to call up and say, hey, I don't have any uh, electricity right now because a branch fell on a, on a line and it's only affecting two or three houses. So, Richard, um, David mentioned some of the benefits and some of the uh, steps, but uh, we have a question. Would this apply if you're a smaller utility as well? Are these same issues that in play? Yes. Uh, obviously, the scaling issues would be less severe in a small utility. Uh, but uh, we've worked with clients who have had everywhere from hundreds of thousands of meters. Sometimes that's a, a phase one rollout of a particular segment of their customer base that they're doing to clients we're working with now who have over 10 million meters as their target. And I think all of them, in fact, sometimes there are things that the, the smaller companies are able to do simply because of the scale of being less that even allows them to take more advantage of the uh, capabilities that are available. One more question, and we'll uh, get back into the presentation. But Richard, uh, David had mentioned pushback as one of the issues. Uh, who owns the smart meter data? Typically, the data is owned by the utility, which which owns the transmission grid. Uh, it's part of the smart grid, and you know I think the the data is usually owned by the people who own uh, own the grid and, and uh, have provided the meters and are selling the electricity. In some regions, that is a government utility. 
um, you know, in America, it's more typically a private but highly regulated private utility, PGE for me here in uh, the Portland, Oregon. There's several other smaller power providers for other other cities here. But I think everywhere you see that the grid is larger. And so while the MDM application and the smart meter data would tend to be owned by the utility, it's likely that a lot of that data would also be of use to, say, uh, Bonneville Power, uh, which is the major hydroelectric power provider in our area. And there probably would be a public entity like the Public Utilities Commission involved in deciding which data can be transmitted from the uh, power utility to the other power generators and other people who would have a legitimate need for that data. And of course, in some cases, there may be a data uh, anonymization that is required or aggregation to remove any individual data. Things like that would be very typical requirements that PUCs or even uh, privacy officers in utilities will, will put on uh, IT departments to uh, comply with, with privacy policies and regulations. Thank you. We had several questions coming up about what is a time series data type, also about specifics of the analytics, and I think we're going to cover many of those things in this next section, and including as we get into the case studies. So I'll ask you to hold those for right now, uh, and we'll move forward. And I just want to let you know that you know Richard also got more than a couple, about two decades of experience. He's led development teams at both Tandem and Informix. He's done a lot of work uh, information aggregation acquisition, aggregation, integration, with the emphasis on business intelligence, data warehousing, and cloud computing, some of the, the real tough uh, issues that come up in this meter data management uh, issue. And so with that, uh, Richard, please take us through. Great. Thanks. So when we talk about smart meters, I think David covered this, there's really many components to a successful smart meter program. And kind of the main ones are called out here. So I think David has done a good job of providing an overview for the whole area. I'm really going to drill down particularly on this third bullet here, the information technology systems that support the total smart meter, smart grid system. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the feedback tools, because the feedback tools are very connected to this, the information infrastructure that, that you provide. So what are clients seeing? Well, clients who come to us frequently have started at the client's end, at the customer, the electricity user's end, and, and uh, done work on figuring out the, the metering and then the telecommunications that's needed, the networking connections. And a lot of times they've thought that because they have an enterprise database and the enterprise database is successfully handling the billing, say, for a million customers, that it's a pretty robust database and is capable of scaling up to be the, the center point for the MDM application and the uh, focal point for driving all of the uh, analytics and other applications we were just talking about. And unfortunately, what they find is that that's not always the case. So this is a uh, example of a client with uh, real-world examples. By the time he scaled up his application, they were up to seven hours to read data for a million meters. Clearly, that is far too slow when the meters are generating data in a 15-minute, uh, half-hour, one-hour cycle. And the reports now had this huge amount of data to, to work through, and those were also taking hours to run. And the fact that there was so much input to the database meant that the total system performance of the, of the database was pulled down, and so people trying to, to, to do reports were finding that the performance was very bad. For, for this client, the bad news was that they weren't really done. The one million was phase one of a several phase plan that intended to get up to three and a half million meters. And so clearly they needed to look at either uh, segmenting the system or uh, upgrading some software or making changes so that they could support the load. And as David mentioned, this isn't really that surprising because the transition from traditional metering to smart metering can result in uh, data uh, 3,000 times more data in a given time period, like say a month. And that, that is a huge several orders of magnitude change. And so I think all of us in IT know that when you have order of magnitude changes like that in a system, uh, often the system needs to be re-architected. Uh, so, so not really a, a huge surprise there. And they also had issues with storage where they had limited money to buy more and more storage with, but yet had a desire for more data online. So basically what the client was faced with was 
a traditional relational database system that was not coping with time series data very well. And what is time series data? Well, it turns out time series data is actually a very unique type of data that has a lot of characteristics that make it quite different from normal data. And for all of the callers who have worked with our relational data, you know, we have this idea of uh, keeping everything very neatly in rows and columns. And for most things that we need to do, for transactional systems like ATM systems and cash register systems, that is a, a very workable system. It scales up well. It provides a lot of clarity. It provides a lot of the, uh, the ACID capabilities, which, which is an acronym for uh, the, the capabilities for databases to protect the data in transactions and roll back and recover from network failures or un other unexpected outages. Those are all great things that we have. But it turns out it really doesn't work very well for time series data, um, where you have a lot of the data is common, the meter ID and all of the uh, addresses and things that go along with that. And really all you want to do is quickly increment, add another value to the time series as you go. That's kind of obviously the way that people think about it, but yet it doesn't really flow into a traditional relational database organizational scheme very well. And time series data also has a set of requirements of things that people want to do with the data, which is also somewhat unique. They want to frequently capture data from sensors. And what that means is that they have a lot of data coming in really fast because the number of sensors is in the millions or hundreds of thousands or tens of millions. And they want to, once they've captured this data, uh, they want to access it by time range, sometimes with cutoffs from 10 p.m. to 10 a.m., from 6 p.m. to, to uh, 12 a.m., those sorts of things. And they want to be able to do what ifs, look at data in the past, maybe make some predictions about data in a certain time range in the future. And to do all this, they need to keep a lot of data online. So part of the value of capturing time series data is, is keeping it around. And finally, they want to be able to combine the time series data with other data, which implies some level of uh, connectivity and ability to uh, build composite applications that use time series data as well as information uh, perhaps even unstructured information from other sources.